and Eve and Chandra are going to lead us into it. Thank you, Mace and Pamela. Great to have you back. Thanks, Karen, for hosting last week. And it's good to be all here together with you <laughs> in that order. Uh, Eve is here with me tonight, too. Hi, Eve. And I also just saw that, that Walt said that it looks like um, our old space is now rented to a preschool child care organization. That makes me so happy. You know, it's sad that we can't be there, but it's, I, I'm so glad it's not something, you know, else. Uh, that's great. So thanks for sharing that. I rejoice in their good fortune, Mudita. And uh, so let's begin. Tonight is our launching of our new book study group. Uh, not group. It's not like a book study group, but a book study. And you're the group for tonight. Um, and you're welcome to come back, drop in, come and go. It's okay if you miss some. These chapters are so rich and juicy in and of themselves that we were just talking earlier, Eve and I, about how sometimes we might just hover on one chapter for a while and unpack the rich quotes that are in there. So, you know, it might not be so linear. We're going to just dig in and enjoy the moment together with these teachings of the path on the path to enlightenment book in case you want to get it haven't gotten it yet on the path to enlightenment it might be backwards but i think you can get it <laughs> we are going in reverse <laughs> in the path to enlightenment <laughs> we are reverse engineering back to our buddha nature which is in the heart space so um very excited to crack this open with you. We're going to talk a little bit about the introduction and the first chapter, which is about um, you know gratitude really towards our human existence, this birth we have in this human body. And uh, these quotes are kind of different than than what I'm used to reading on that topic. So I'm really really excited about unpacking it. And Eve's got passages she wants to discuss. I'll probably discuss a passage too. But without further ado, I think um, we're ready to dive into practice. Always a good way to start the evening. So please make yourself comfortable in an upright or supine position. And we will meditate for, you know, about 30 minutes or so, 35 minutes, maybe 30. So take a moment and really make sure you've got everything set. You've turned off your notifications, you're warm or cool enough, you're comfortable. It's really a nice time to really claim your space. You know, take your seat. It's a special thing we're doing here. It's just not like watching TV, you know. So take a moment to make sure that you're feeling good about where you're at, how you're sitting or lying, and allow the eyes to close. And start to take some deep breaths, feeling the breath descending into your belly region. Really release any tension you might be holding there in the kidneys, the sides, the front of the belly. If you've got a tight belt or waistline, loosen it. Really let the belly soften and respond to the breath. Releasing tension with the out breath. Shoulders melting. Inhale again. It can be helpful to take intentional deep breaths to begin and releasing with the out breath. You might uncover other areas of tension that you didn't even know you were holding, like in your face, your jaw, perhaps the neck, throat. Notice the arms, relax tension in the arms and shoulders and the hands can be in your lap or on your thighs, whatever comfortable position you like to take. Feel the pelvic bowl nice and rooted and stable on your seat, your cushion, and feel the spine like a natural S-curve growing up and out of the bowl of the pelvis, distributing the weight of your body evenly without strain. Relax the hips. 
legs, feet. Body is the sacred mandala, it's your temple for life, for practice. So nourish it with the breath. Take a moment now to arouse your heartfelt motivation for your practice. If you wish, you can take the mudra of the bodhicitta, which is the two middle fingers straight, the other is folded. This symbolizes the single pointed intention to awaken for the benefit of all beings, including yourself, of course. Now let that intention really feel personal as it bleeds into your breath. It's like now the gates are opening and that awareness, that intention to heal, to be awake in this body, in this life, translates into mindfulness of the breath in the body. Let your mindfulness, your awareness flood your body like a floodgate opening. Flood your body from the top to the base, feeling the sensations of the breath as it flows in and out. We'll settle the body, speech, and mind in their natural state with the breath, simple, relaxed, breathing, alighting the mind upon the breath as it flows in and out of the body. And I'll count to 21. You can too if you want as a stabilizing practice, or you can just breathe and settling the mind in its natural state, relaxed, releasing, grasping, and distraction, returning to the breath, refreshing your awareness.
And now shifting into settling the mind in its natural state with the gaze slightly open. Gently opening the gaze at a comfortable angle towards the floor, softening the eyes. And let the gaze be vacant. So not staring at any one thing in particular, but soften it. As if you could see a full 360 degrees around you. The feeling is, is that the field, the visual field, becomes more like a, a, an orb, circular instead of linear and pointed. One could say it's more of a lantern illumination, a lantern consciousness, rather than spotlight consciousness. So let it be diffuse and soft. Over time, the eyes will get used to resting with the eyes open at the beginning if this is new for you feel free to rest and blink whenever you need to as the muscles behind and around the eyes soften and relax it will feel more natural We're still maintaining the awareness of the breath in the body, but that focus is diminished. And what has increased is the awareness of the domain of the mind itself. As if there were an arena in front of you of the mind within which thoughts arise and pass like actors on a stage. Entrance, entering and exiting, playing out their roles. And you, as an observer, are witnessing, but not getting involved, not jumping up on the stage and joining. See if you can sit back and relax a bit and just observe the mind with the thoughts coming and going, free of grasping, free of distraction. And if you noticed you're being pulled up onto the stage, up into the storyline and getting lost in thought, once you notice that, come back to the body, sit back again in the body, relax, release with the out breath and return to the awareness of the domain of the mind. This is shamatha and the object is the domain of the mind itself. Mindfulness of the mind, the third of the four foundations of mindfulness.
this form of training the mind to observe thought but not identify onto it is can be extremely freeing. Even in the most deepest depth of despair or torment, if we've practiced this, we can unfuse from the thoughts that bring us suffering, that bring us to rock bottom. We can see them for what they are, a part of us, but not all of us. A part of me feels despair. A part of me is depressed. A part of me is excited. But that's not all of who I am. And sit back and soften into the more expansive identity of your awareness that embraces or that holds all of these appearances, pleasurable, unpleasurable, everything in between, and identify on that, into that, onto that, with that, rather than these temporary fleeting thoughts that are so unsatisfactory, because they're always changing and they're not the wholeness of who we are. The deep satisfaction comes with the training of the mind to come again and again, come home again and again. It's actually not confining, it's liberating. But you have to find your way there. You have to make it liberating by releasing and staying, releasing and staying, not clamping down and tensing. It's a release and a resting and a stabilizing. And rest in that experience of awareness. It's like the luminosity of the sun shining in all directions, that knowing quality. A wakefulness.
Now for the final phase of our practice together, we'll do a form of gratitude practice, focusing on the, the body, our vehicle, our temple, our sacred mandala within this life, this, this precious human life. Of course, none of us are completely perfect. There are things we wish were better or different about our body, but at the same time, we can all acknowledge that there are so many things we can be grateful for that we can give thanks to and appreciate the still work. And so I'd like to invite you to descend your attention down into the lower half of your legs. So from the knees down, including the toes, the feet, the ankles, the shins and calves, the bones, the knees. And just take a moment and really touch on whatever it is down there that you would like to be thankful. Express your gratitude toward, like, thank you, feet, for walking me around. Or thank you, calves, for being the heart, the pulsing heart of blood and circulation in my legs while I walk. And so on, just make it up. You know, you might not be grateful for everything there, but find the things that you are grateful for, even the imperfections. Perhaps you're grateful that those teach you patience or forbearance. Really give gratitude here, really, even internally or out externally, say thank you, thank you, thank you. Make it personal. And then now for the upper part of the legs, the thighs, the femurs, into the hips, the pelvis, the pelvic floor, the genitals, into that whole lower waist. Just focusing here, we'll go part by part so we can really shine the light of our gratitude into certain areas of the body that might be neglected or ignored or undervalued. including the bowl of the pelvis and everything that's found in there. Thank you, or even just saying thank you. It's finding those aspects of your being that are still giving you life and the joy of this human existence. And then making your way up through the torso, the kidneys, adrenals, the organs, Spine, the heart, the lungs. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So often we fixate on what's not working. So right now we're just focusing and celebrating what is working 
and giving thanks. So much to be grateful for. Breath, the heartbeat. Our digestive tract. And making your way up through the shoulders, down through the arms, the neck, and all the way up to the head. Just taking some time to really touch with the light of your attention, like a gentle stroke, a gentle touch of gratitude. It's all those sensory organs that live in the head that are perhaps still working, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue. Thank you. The eyes that can see the beloved, see the green and the trees, the blue sky. Thank you. The tongue that tastes these delicious flavors. And so on. Make your own prayer of gratitude. The arms, the hands that can touch and embrace those you love, give relief and warmth to others. Thank you. Of course, the mind, thank you. The brain nervous system. So now feel the gratitude circulating through all of your veins, like the blood, filling the whole body from top to bottom, bottom to top. skin, the touch, sensation of the clothes, the air, the other. Even if we have just this one life, there's so much to be grateful for, so much to be held and honored and made use of for the benefit of those around us. And if there are more lives, if there are more lives beyond this life, then the karmic seeds we're planting now will bear fruit and bring benefit in the future.
And let's dedicate the merit of our practice for the benefit of all. Offering it up like a drop of water, releasing into the vast ocean of positivity for the benefit of the whole world and beyond. Offering that up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's fun to see people joining in from all around, even out on the East Coast. Leanne, welcome from Brooklyn. <laughs> so any any reflections that want to come now out of the out of the uh, fertility of the meditation before we dive into our book uh, our chapter you can unmute or chat in if you like This gratitude meditation is setting us up <laughs> for, you know, good life, but also for a good class. <laughs> Eve's going to take it away with, with discussion um, around that in a moment. But, um, if there's nothing that wants to come forth, then we'll keep going. Eve, you want to jump in? Thank you, Chandra. Thank you for such a beautiful practice. Um, yeah, I felt just the richness of um, settling into the practice phase by phase and step by step. <clears throat> and also really share enthusiasm in, in starting this book together. You, you mentioned it, gosh, probably over a year ago. Um, and I, I wanna set the stage for us a little bit on this book and what we'll be doing together. So the book is a collection of quotes from many meditation masters throughout uh, thousands of years. As I think Chandra shared last week, unfortunately, almost all of them are men. Uh, other than that, it is a lovely collection uh, of wisdom teachings. And it is organized by Mathieu Ricard, who some of you may know. He is a scholar and a monk, and he's a true bodhisattva. He dedicates... Um, almost all of his energy and effort outside of um, practice and into supporting social projects uh, that matter to him. So there's something um, very powerful when you actually get to know um, a teacher and you see by how they live their life that they're living the practice. I can, I, I say that with um, a lot of confidence from Etty Ricard. He's truly living the practice in giving so much to these um, kind of social projects of preserving Tibetan culture and supporting school children. And you don't have to take my word for it because he did not love this, but he was also named the happiest person in the world according to his brain. So in a variety of neuroscience studies, they looked at the development of certain parts of his brain highly associated with happiness. And I am not one to reify the brain, but I thought that that was kind of sweet, that not only in his actions and behaviors in the world do we see this beacon of really kind of uh, joyfulness and uh, alignment, but they also found that that was mirrored in his brain. And um, I have had the very good fortune of, of getting to meet him a couple times and um, he shared that, um, you know, the big question is, of course, was he always going to be the happiest man on the planet? Or was it really just Buddhist practice that's helped him? And he shared that uh, his mother could attest that it's absolutely the Buddhist practice. Because before he came into the teachings, he was a rascal. Um, which you can kind of see like a little bit of that mischievousness still in his eye um, and in his presence. So. I thought that was a, a good outside corroborator that indeed the practices have created just this, um, this warm, loving being. He's written many books and um, 
Yeah, Walt just asked if he was a scientist. He was a, a biologist. Um, his dad was a philosopher. One of his books is them debating the worldview of materialism and spirituality. And he just collected this really very humbly of here are some, you know, of here are selections. He says, by no means an anthology, but a selection of certain quotes that have inspired me on the path. And I think it's really useful for us to remember that our meditation practice, of course, includes the training of our, our mind, our body, and our heart through deliberate practice. And it relies so much upon <clears throat> being inspired by these teachings over and over and over. I don't want to be a spoiler alert here, but I don't think you're going to hear anything new in this book if you're a Dharma practitioner. You're going to hear the very same teachings presented in many beautiful ways. And that inspiration along the path is so important. It's almost as though we get to bring alive these great masters here with us. He included in the book a small biography um, of uh, almost every, or sorry, of everyone he has included in the book. So we will also share a little bit about some of the teachers that we're learning from just through each of these quotes. I want to share a quote uh, from, from Matthew. He writes just a little bit to introduce the book and introduce every chapter. Um, and I think this one is quite encouraging. He says, the practice of Buddhism does not require us to give up what is good in our life, but to abandon the causes of suffering to which we are often attached to, to the point of addiction. I think that that's so powerful. So we don't embark on this path to enlightenment in order to give up what we enjoy. Like, oh, they're going to tell me I can't eat what I want to eat and I shouldn't watch action movies and I should, you know, meditate more. And God, I just have to give stuff up to be a good practitioner. And he's saying it doesn't require you to give up what is good in your life, but abandon the causes of suffering to which we are often attached to, to the point of addiction. Very powerful. And it's true. And the saying it in that simple way, that these things that we are attached to that cause us suffering, like, you know, an addiction to anything, food or sex or uh, substance, it feels outside of our control. But we believe it will make us happy. And so that's this, you know, this, this ongoing journey of continuing to see more clearly <clears throat> what is wholesome and what is unwholesome. And then we get this beautiful, natural renunciation. We don't have to say, okay, I'm not going to do these things. That's the precepts. They say, don't do it. We actually naturally feel inspired to let go because we see how much it doesn't work for us. So maybe some of you, um, I've noticed this, I, I uh, like a lot of people, uh, I enjoy gossip, it's great. Uh, there's some wholesome gossip out there where you're sharing information and it's beneficial. But then there's that gossip and you know it's like really not helping anyone. <laughs> you are actually, as they say, just talking shit. And there's kind of like an energy to it and it can feel like you're bonding or getting closer. But there's also a queasiness because you realize is that somebody's expense, right? That somebody's expense. And so you don't need to believe like, gosh, I shouldn't act outside of right speech. You just tune in to the felt experience of engaging in behaviors that are harmful. And um, yeah, it, 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 I'm not going to lie. It, it can make you slightly like less of a... Um, you know, less of a go along with conventional reality person, um, not wanting to engage in certain activities like that. But ultimately, people are going to be drawn to the optimism, the joy and the buoyancy of being close to the teachings. I, I wholeheartedly believe everyone I've ever met who has even a, a smidge of attainment in these practices, I just want to be close to them all the time. Right? Yes, they're not going to gossip with me and they're maybe not going to binge watch and stay up late, but they're just, you know, that's just such an appealing quality. Um, 
the other thing he says um, is that the Buddhist path is structured so that it takes into account the gradual nature of inner transformation. Phew, what a relief. <laughs> it's gradual. There's steps, right? I think that that is just so encouraging. Again, I, I think what I love about Mathieu's writing, especially in this book, is it's just very simple. Um, it's very comforting. And I think that that really is a, a guidepost along the way. Um, Chandra, I know there was another part of the opening section you wanted to, to share with folks. Yeah, I so love that. Thank you, Eve. And and so I what I'd like to just highlight in the introduction is is the the framework of this book and a beautiful quote by Matthew Ricard's teacher, Dilgo Kense Rinpoche. So I'll just touch on that for a few moments before we dive into the, the chapter one. So Matthew Ricard kind of paints the story of in, in the preface actually, why about why he put together this small anthology. He says this is not all encompassing by any means, but it is a compilation of some of the most beautiful passages that he's had the privilege of reading, he said. So he he found them, they were meaningful to him, and then he translated most of them. And he's takes he notes whenever he's using somebody else's translation. But he 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 talks about how in Bhutan in 1981, um, his teacher, the great Tibetan spiritual master Dilgo Kense Rinpoche, who was born in 1910 and died in 1991, um, he was giving a transmission of a famous compilation of texts called the Treasury of Spiritual Instructions, the Dangak Zu in Tibetan. And this transmission, it's like the oral transmission, they literally read every word of the text. He, he Teachers do that to give the lung, the oral transmission of that particular text to the students so that then those, the lung is like planting the seeds in them and then they can study and recite and practice and teach themselves. And this lasted for two months. <laughs> There's so many volumes in this Dham Ngak Zhe, the treasury of spiritual instructions. Two months, it's a 13 volume collection by the great Jamgun Kongtrul, who is a, really has that wonderful short commentary on the long, uh, the mind training Lojong teachings that we study. He's also found in quotations in this book. But he is Jamgun Kongtrul is one of the greatest masters of the 19th century. And he brought together the pith instructions of what are known as the eight great chariots of the accomplishment lineage. The eight chariots are the main transmission lineages of Buddhist teachings that flourished in Tibet. And they include the Nyingma, which is primarily even my um, lineage for the most part, which means the ancient tradition. That's the first tradition, the first lineage that came from India to Tibet, the Nyingma. Then you have the Geluk Kadampa, which is another beautiful strain lineage, most famous figure in the world in this one is His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and that was a later development in, in Tibet. There's the Sakya, which traces their lineage all the way back to Sakyamuni, Shakyamuni Buddha. And then the Kagyu, the Kagyu is the oral lineage of, of great yogi tradition. The Karmapa is one of them. Kala Rinpoche is in the Kagyu. The Shangpa Kagyu, I believe that's Kala Rinpoche, if I'm not mistaken. That's another lineage. Then the Kala Chakra lineage, which is the wheel of time. And maybe some of you have received the Kala Chakra initiation. How many people have gotten an empowerment by His Holiness the Dalai Lama or other teachers in the Kala Chakra? Yeah, just a few of us. That's, a, that's, a, that's something to do. Like if you ever have a chance to go to a Kala Chakra, the wheel of time initiation by His Holiness the Dalai Lama or anyone else, do it. It's meant to bring great blessings to the area the land, the spirits, the beings, the humans, everyone in that area. It's very powerful. Then you have the organ Yendrup, uh, which I actually am not that familiar with that one. And then the Ch Shije tradition is one of the eight great chariots in Tibet. Ch is the lineage established by Machi Glabdran, the 11th century Tibetan yogini, a female teacher who uh, 
developed uh, many beautiful teachings and practices. It's one of my primary lineages as well. And that is the practice that the feeding your demons is based on. How many people came last week feeding your demons? Yeah. So that practice is based on the ch in this one. Shije also means pacification of suffering. And that's a whole other fascinating aspect of the ch. So you can find out more in the appendix on these lineages if you want to read more about those. So he set the stage. So he's getting all of these wonderful downloads from Dilko Kensei Rinpoche for two months. And Matthew Ricard, who was very close to him, who was his translator. One evening after the teachings, Kensei Rinpoche said to Matthew Ricard, quote, when we come to appreciate the depth of the view of the saint, wait, when we come to appreciate the depth of the view of the eight great traditions, and also see that they all lead to the same goal without contradicting each other, we think only ignorance can lead us to adopt a sectarian attitude. That speaks so much to me because as we're Westerners kind of importing Dharma from all these different parts of the world, we can get a little sectarian because we don't know that much. <laughs> we, we, we don't know that much because we only get kind of through one teacher, you know, and we think, okay, that's the way it is there in Thailand, or that's the way it is there in Burma, or that's the way it is there in Tibet, or India. But there's so much more to know. And what he's saying is so true that the more we know, the less ignorance we have, right? So if we're not ignorant, if we know more, then we appreciate more, and we see the interconnectedness of everything. So he said, only ignorance can lead us to adopt a sectarian attitude, right? So only when we're small-minded do we become sectarian. And so celebrating all these different eight lineages, Matthew Ricard made a vow to translate his favorite passages from not just his lineage, which is Nyingma, but all of those eight. And that's what we find here in this text. So I felt that that was important for us to understand and to appreciate and to learn from. Yeah. Eve. Wonderful. Yeah. And so this first chapter, which we will at least start this evening, gets us into part one, which is turning the mind to the spiritual path. And it's a really nice continuation of um, our Lojong, which we finished. And in the Lojong teachings, we start with the preliminaries, which I um, I am fond of saying are by no means preliminary. The preliminary practices, right? It's, it's what's needed to be done to start. But sometimes we have to revisit that every day. Um, you know, I think of the preliminaries actually sometimes the most instructive, the most clear. Um, we're really reminding us why we're doing what we're doing. And in this first preliminary practice or chapter here, it's the value of human existence, or as Chandra was beautifully leading us through, the preciousness of human life. It's such a nice turn of phrase. Uh, I know for many of us, it's so familiar. It's something we hear in the teachings a lot, the preciousness of human life. I think it, however, <laughs> it can have a little bit of a, um, maybe a little bit of weight or baggage with it. When we think of the preciousness of human life, often the teachings that follow are, don't squander it. Don't let it run away with you. And I don't know about you all, but when I hear that, I'm like, oh God, I'm definitely not doing enough. I'm for sure squandering. There are so many more moments of the day I could be dedicating to my practice or um, learning more. And I'm so busy. And if I was less busy, I would definitely less squander and connect more. And that's not what it's about at all. That is not what that teaching is about. The preciousness of human life, it really gets us to this practice as, as again, as Chandra mentioned, of gratitude, just the most deep gratitude possible. I, I got to see a, a acupuncturist who I've been working with today and nothing gets me closer to appreciating the human body than um, my human body in pain and in distress. 
And when someone is kind of like helping you work with that pain and distress, and you just realize, wow, what a gift having this human body and, you know, having to work with it too. When we think of this kind of preciousness of the human body and being able to receive the teachings is, is really what's intended. That according to some worldviews, and this may not be yours, we could have been born as a ladybug or as a um, really wonderful cat, like I have sleeping over there. And I saw um, another cat earlier this evening. And it, you know, I, I don't know, I, I do think YOLO is receiving the teachings in some ways right now. But as a human body and with a mind, right, it's much easier to hear what is said and to let it marinate in us and transform us. You do not have to believe in reincarnation to think that this is precious, this human life. It's really not required. And I think, you know, um, some, some of the ways that uh, we really think of the preciousness of human life isn't, okay, this human life is precious. What are you going to do to show someone or the world that you are precious? It's actually the opposite. It's that this human life is precious because you are always already innately qualified and um, prepared to experience the preciousness that's in you. Such an affirming message. It's a really hard one. It, it can really bounce off us. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm precious like everybody else and just not listen to it. But what it's pointing to is this is why it's preliminary, but not easy or preliminary, but not unimportant to really appreciate the preciousness of human life is to appreciate that we are precious. There is something just fundamentally good, basically good, or if maybe this is more tolerable, basically okay, right? which I have heard Chogyam Trimpa and Silkni Rinpoche both say basic goodness, basic okayness. What an amazing thing to really hold in the mind. The very first step on your spiritual practice, you are precious. You are indestructibly precious. No amount of, um, you know, thoughts or behaviors can take that away. Is that a relief? <sighs> So I, I'll read just one, um, one or two here. Ah, yes. Um, so this, um, speaking of Dilgo Kensei Rinpoche, ask yourself how many of the billions of inhabitants of this planet realize how rare it is to have been born a human being? How many of those who realize this think of using that chance to practice the Dharma? how many actually start to practice, how many continue, how many of those who continue attain ultimate realization. The number of those who attain ultimate realization is like the number of stars you can see at daybreak compared to the number of stars you can see on a clear night. We need to be born a human being as this is the only state of existence in which there is enough suffering to give us an acute desire to be free from samsara. Yet not so much suffering that we no longer have the opportunity to free ourselves through the practice of Dharma. If we do not make use of this precious opportunity of a human existence, we cannot go but downward like a stone rolling down a hill. I especially love that the recognition we have just enough suffering in this life, just enough. It's needed. Without it, we would just be content to distract ourselves. So just enough, but not too much suffering. Chandra, I'd love to hear what you think on those. And uh, yeah, yeah. I love that. You know, we have just enough suffering and just enough ease. <laughs> We're just there in the middle, you know, to, to practice the Dharma. Yeah, I appreciate that. I um, I love Dogo Kensei's teachings. If you can, um, just I'll type in his name here. 
and after like click like get his name write it down and then youtube him <laughs> he was an amazing amazing teacher a giant of a man which is not common in tibet to be really tall i think he was six four or six three and he spent 12 years in a cave and an amazing yogi and then married and was a father and a householder as well one of those types of lamas teachers who've done both you know monastic and householder so so much wisdom one of the greatest masters of our time so check him out there's some good documentaries about him eve do you remember what they're called yeah i'll, look it up. I'll put it in the chat oh, you could look it up while I, yeah while i'm reading the next quote great documentaries so inspiring that could be a part of your homework this week <laughs> get the book read it read the first chapter and then watch a documentary about Dilgo Kense I think you'll get you'll have a lot of appreciation for Matthew Ricard for Dilgo Kense and why we're so enthusiastic about this book and this teacher so I wanted to read a passage um it's it's a little long. It's on page 15 through 17. It's like a poem, but I'll, I'll, I'll see how far I get. This is from Mingling Terchen Gyurme Dorje. Say that three times real fast. <laughs> this is uh, advice to ease the pain of a noble lady named Sinam Paldrun, a native of Ukpa Lung in Tibet. He was alive in the 16 and 1700s in his biographies in the back of the book. He was a famous Tertun, a treasure revealer, teacher of Dzogchen, great perfection. Namo Guru Ratnaye. So he's saying, I pay homage to the precious jewel teacher. Homage to the masters in the three jewels, which is a common way of uh, beginning a text, the three jewels of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. My mind closely united with that of the immensely good teacher. So that starts by saying, I'm merging my mind with the teacher. This is a common, um, a common way of receiving the blessings is actually praying to merge your mind with your teacher, your mentor, whether it's a person in, in a body or a, maybe a spiritual teacher, Jesus, Buddha, God, actually all of that can work. So homage to the masters. My mind is closely united with that of the immensely good teacher. I beg him or her to rain on us the shower of blessings. Such a beautiful image. So that all painful circumstances may be spontaneously liberated in great bliss. The alternation of thoughts of happiness and suffering, desire and aversion is nothing more <clears throat> than the play of luminous emptiness in mind. So we touched on that in the meditation, right? The hopes and fears, the suffering, the pleasure, all of that are displays, effulgences, expressions of the ground of our own being, our luminous, <clears throat> empty mind. Meaning when it's empty, it's not like, you know, like a vacant in a bad way, but like the interconnected, fullness emptiness that we speak of in buddhism so what he's saying he's giving meditation instruction right here he says without altering whatever arises look at its nature and you will perceive it as great bliss so it's like everything even even suffering feelings and thoughts have within them at their deepest core a nugget of energy potential energy that is bliss so check that out for yourself test that out for yourself and see if that's true <laughs> he says while you have this human existence i'm on page 16 now at the top while you have this human existence apply yourself wholly to practice the supreme supreme dharma the thousand things to be done will never end do we know that feeling yes they are vain distractions devoid of substance. Okay, well, maybe not all of it, but a lot of it is. <laughs> Forsake them all completely. So this is beautiful. It's also mainly talking to monastics, right? So the monastic ideal is to let go of all the kind of worldly activities 
and devote yourself wholeheartedly to Dharma. So I don't think any of us in this group are monastics. Maybe you are. Please let me know if you are. So we have to take this with a grain of salt. You know, we can read it, get inspiration by it, but we can also know that maybe we do 50% of that. You know? Or we do what we can do because we are not monastics yet. Maybe in the future, if you want to. When he says, when you have subdued an opponent, a thousand more are still to be overcome, meaning thoughts and people and things and problems. He says, instead, crush your negative emotions, which are the enemies dwelling in your mind. Now, this is not uncommon as kind of having the battle, the warring mentality around thoughts, you know, thoughts are the enemies, you have to crush them. But, you know, it's dramatic. It has some flair to it. Um, of course, it's also good to attend to and nourish and, and welcome in those feelings to bring them home. So family and friends may get along, but discord easily arises. Those who are dear to us in this life are also causes of torment. So again, this is more of a monastic ideal of turning away from trying to find all of your joy and pleasure in family, friends, lovers, and so on that we have to turn inside to really find that, that bliss, that satisfaction that we're seeking. Now, as householders, I can say we can do both. We can do the inner work, find our inner resources, but we can also be in relationship and enjoy, right? We don't have to leave our family behind. Okay, so he got he talks about that kind of stuff for a while. <laughs> and then he says, it is absurd to maintain attachment and hatred towards beings of the six realms who have all been our parents. Realize that they are all equal. Is this not in itself a great liberation, a great happiness? So what he's saying here is that if you're stuck in attachment and hatred, especially towards beings in the six realms, which are the hell realms, the hungry ghost realm, the animal realm, the human realm, the jealous God realm, and the God realm, that's kind of classic cosmology in Buddhism. Chogyam Trungpa taught that those are all just states of mind, actually. You know, like hell realm is like getting stuck in anger. It feels oppressive, like you're buried underground sometimes. Hungry ghost realm is when you're never satisfied. You're always thirsting and hungry for more. You can never get enough. So we can take these metaphorically as well. So being stuck in attachment aversion towards all those beings in the six realms who have all been our parents, meaning that from the Buddhist perspective, we have been reborn countless times, countless infinite like even the buddha couldn't find the beginning when he looked back on the night he became enlightened he looked back he looked forward he gave it up he's like in the moment right now is the most important thing so why because we've okay so we've all been born infinite times in infinite dimensions and worlds so buddhists say that we've all at some point been each other's parents <laughs> We're related. Did you know that? We are all related. That's the breaking news tonight. Yay. I see Jenny clapping. So we're family. So then why would I hate on you or want to kill you or hurt you? You know, I have been your parent. You've been my parent at some point. So there's a connection there. There's a humanity. Even the animals too. I'm not just talking about humans. Insects, everything. So realize that because of that, they are all equal. It is not in itself a great, isn't that a great liberation, a great happiness? Last stanza. All happy or unhappy situations are the essence of mind itself, free of mental fabrications, like rainbows that do not alter the sky. Leave everything in vast space, free of attachment. So he's giving meditation instruction there and just life instruction. All of these appearances are like rainbows in the sky. They come, they go, but they themselves don't change or alter the sky. What does that mean? 
That means the sky is your Buddha nature that we all have, Tathagata Garbha. Isn't that beautiful, these images? The rainbows appear, the thoughts, the tears, the joy, the regret, the heartbreak. All of that appears like rainbows forming and dissolving in the sky. But we have to understand those are just parts of us, right? They don't alter the sky-like nature of mind that we all have. I think, what, what did you say, Eve, at the beginning? We all are qualified. That's our qualification. I love that. I love that, that we're all qualified to be here and to be happy here, to be fully doing ourselves. You do you, I'll do me. We're qualified. <laughs> we all have Buddha nature. Mm. So I want to read this stanza one more time and then you hand it over to Eve. All happy or unhappy situations are the essence of mind itself, free of mental fabrications. Like rainbows that do not alter the sky, leave everything in vast space free from attachment. Yeah, how wonderful. Hallelujah. <laughs> mm, yeah. I, I, I really do hope that these words feel in, inspiring, right? Of course, you can hear a bit of devotion um, coming through Chandra and I just because it, it feels like a, a reunion and a rejoicing to hear these words that um, are inspiring and comforting. But what I would actually love is, is to hear from folks, is there a sense, are you feeling some kind of pointing out towards this preciousness of human existence? And if it's not in this moment, are there glimpses of that? When is that available? Mace and or Pamela. So fun. Um, but I really want to comment, and I'm curious how you guys might comment about this, the attachment, this word attachment, because I think there's something very important there. I think, especially the way my mind has understood attachment. And I wonder if there's like a Western idea of attachment or that maybe there's a different intonation that they're speaking of, because I think I, for a long time and still do whatever like that attachment piece and like, how are we like letting go of attachment without the quality of aversion or pushing away or like, you know, drying ourselves up, right? Because of like, cause it, there's this like devotion mm. is not, it's, I don't know the right word. Anyway, that's enough. If you guys want to comment. So wait, tell me, tell me just a tiny bit more on, um, is this relating to the attachment towards that which, is like an addiction and harmful to us or? Well, I think I'm, I'm wanting more conversation about like that, what is this attachment, right? And how we attach mm. or how we rest without attachment, but also without the rejection, right? Because right. when you're like, oh, rest and don't be attached, there can be a lot that kind of goes on in that particular um, edge of like, what is resting without attachment really mean, right? And yeah, there is the like, I mean, like addiction is like the, if you put a range, maybe I'm suggesting there's a range, right? And addiction is like clinging, like even being aggressive in a protective mode around hmm. whatever we're clinging to, right? And then is there like, even another word, like sometimes when we talk about emptiness or whatever, we'll use different words around it that, so, helpful it's such a i i'm sure both of us um have um ideas to share what, what comes to mind for me immediately is um when we really can integrate this idea of this preciousness this um, basic okayness or goodness that we have there's a there's a confidence that arises but it's not an egoic confidence it's a confidence of yeah, that, that being um, naturally already okay. And when I think of attachment, we, we can borrow from contemporary psychology and the incredible research on 
how we form our sense of self and our sense of self in relation to others with attachment theory. And one of the key aspects of attachment is when we feel confident that the environment is supportive of us, supportive in terms of relationships to a primary other, we have a safe base and we can securely explore. So if we apply that same idea to, our, to ourselves as practitioners, what gives us a sense of like a safe base here? So we can securely explore. If we don't feel safe, we're gonna grasp. Oh, I don't know, I'm not sure. Like we're hanging onto the side of the pool. Right. So I think there's something interesting in, in how can we experience a devotion or experience bliss or experience some of the amazing um, opportunities that practice offers us without that kind of uh, attachment, which we're saying can can be harmful or an obstacle on the path. And some of it does come from that sense of. Yeah, I, I am absolutely as is said, primordially qualified to be here. I am already intrinsically good. So that may touch to some of what you're you're speaking to. Chandra, I'd love to hear your thoughts. That's great. I love your perspective. It's often so good and juicy and palpable and um, helps me understand the more modern interpretations too. Um, and I would like to see the Tibetan of this phrase, you know, rest without attachment, because it could also be rest without clinging, which is often a teaching, and gra or grasping, rest without grasping. And that's one word. So grasping in Tibetan is zin, zin, which literally means like, to, you know, so rest like that, like. It's more of a release. So it's not a pushing away. It's not an aversion. It's not like, ooh, go away. <laughs> um, but it's not a, ooh, yum, come here. You know, it's that middle ground of like the open palm, the open palm hmm. resting. But if, if attachment could also be desire, which is duchak, duchak, which is that kind of like even more passionate kind of like, I want to, I want you, you know, <laughs> like I'm going to eat you. You're so delicious. You know, that's like more of that kind of attachment. I don't think he's talking about that kind of passion, desire, dujak. Um, that's usually not used in this type of instruction. So, you know, you know, the word Zen, like in Zimba Rongdral, right? The natural liberation of clinging that we do at Tara Mandala. So it's that profound teaching of just unraveling mm. into the natural state by not grasping, just releasing, open palm, just resting like a snake that naturally unwinds of its own accord when it's in a knot or whatever, that feeling of, or like a, a bundle of straw that's been, you know, the string has been cut and it just, that's the not grasping, just the rest like that. I think that's what he meant, I, I, but I need to see the Tibetan to make sure. Anyone else? Uh, Chandra, I have a question. Yeah, that, um, it isn't related to what you were just talking about, but okay. um, how much should we read in the book uh, before each session? Are you going to do a chapter a week, a section? Best guess? <laughs> yeah, I think we've almost made it through this chapter, but there could be chapters where we spend a couple weeks. Uh -huh. um, yeah, that's. Yeah, because I think it's, you know, again, some of these, I will just use this opportunity to slip in one more, which is some of them are just such lovely image pictures. And it gives us this, um, you know, Chandra was describing these two beautiful analogies of cutting the cord of the tight, She's talking tightly to held straw, or, um, you know, or kind of uh, having the um, snake unwind itself. And some of these images, they, they might really be able to just give us that sense where we can deeply feel or, or know what we're looking for in practice. Um, so yeah, so I would say 
read as much as you like. Uh, we will make our way slowly and meander. And um, yeah, I'll share just this, this one beautiful image that when I read it, um, I started this book probably over a year ago and I still remembered it and was like, oh, when are we gonna read that? And there it was in the first chapter. Uh, um, so this is um, Control Lodro Taye. Uh, getting butter from milk is only possible because milk already contains cream. No one ever made butter by churning water. The prospector looks for gold in rocks and not in wood chips. Likewise, the quest for perfect enlightenment only makes sense because Buddha nature is already present in every being. Without that nature, all efforts would be futile. And I, I just love that idea again, that we are already the gold. We are already the cream or the plant milk alternative. Um, <laughs> And it's so encouraging, so encouraging. And so, yeah, you know, of course the Dogo Kense <clears throat> documentary is your homework, but another homework is to connect with that sense of preciousness of this human life without it feeling like a heavy trip, right? Without it feeling like, oh God, this is such a responsibility. I have this life and I'm, I need to do so much, but to feel instead, right, that, that that is a gift and that there is, um, I loved what um, Mahin said here, ev the preciousness of every breath I take to be able to feel it through our every action, our every thought. Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking, it, even I didn't really talk this through, but this is the thought I'm having now is that we just say this is week one, week two, week three, and that, you know, if you're popping in after being gone for a while and you see on the newsletter that it's okay, we're on week five, you can guesstimate we'll be around chapter five. You know, we might be a little before or after. That's a proposal. I, don't hold me to it. Some of these chapters are so rich that we might spend a month on one chapter and I want to have the freedom to do that. <laughs> so I don't know what else to say about that. Eve, do you have any other feedback or ideas uh, in the moment here? Yeah, I, I'd say um, there's always the YouTube channel to catch up. Oh, so true. If, if you've missed it. And I did get uh, two messages I want to respond to just briefly. Um, one, which is um, very poignant, which is just enough suffering is a luxury, right? There, there are many people who have the precious human life, but the suffering is so great that being able to really sustain a connection with the teachings is hard. And this is something, you know, my colleagues, especially working in public health settings and wanting to translate these teachings as they've been found to be so beneficial across populations living with various degrees of um, safety and, um, and, um, yeah, basic needs being met. So there, there are, there is, there is enough suffering that can be too much um, in this human life. It is kind of, and there are points for all of us. If we're in extreme pain, it can be hard to practice. If we are um, really caring for others to the point where we don't have moments to ourselves, we may not have the time. So I think I appreciate that clarification. And there was another request to have more about that kind of sense of core safety. But suffice to say, um, it can help us with doubt, which was the question. If we, if we have a sense of safety, can it help us work with doubt? Um, yeah, we should spend more time on doubt, but I do think that cultivating the sense of basic okayness, uh, goodness, absolutely can help us have a sense of, um, yeah, um, clarity, I would say, and stability. Okay. Okay. That's all the chats. Um, Chandra, do you wanna, should we dedicate again? the merit of this time together or yeah, why don't you why don't you do that give us a, some, some gift to go, go out on wonderful so yeah taking a moment to return to this beautiful 
precious human body, mind, and heart. Taking just another beat here to really drink in this invitation that these teachings are offering us to recognize or feel that intrinsic gold. Understanding the preciousness of our own human existence also helps us understand the preciousness of all beings. So let's take this moment together and really consider this work we do, strengthening, gaining insight, learning and being together. Let's dedicate that to the sake that all beings could be connected to a sense of worthiness, belonging, that all beings could feel safe and at ease, that all beings could be free. Thank you, Eve. Thank you, everyone. Mason, Pam, and Jason, everyone else, Karen, all future volunteers. Thanks ahead of time. <laughs> we'll see you again soon. Yes. Thank you, Maybe everyone. We'll Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you.